Next we're going to take a look at some special considerations when doing descriptive statistics on spatial data. These considerations stem from the fact that spatial arrangement of data and their boundaries will influence the results of statistical analyses. So geographers who are doing statistical analysis on spatial data must ask what is the geographic extent of the study area? What's the pattern of zones within the study area? And what is the level of aggregation, the level of spatial aggregation of the data? And geographers must realize that the results of their statistical analyses only pertain to the particular spatial arrangement of their data set, meaning the same analysis conducted on the same data but aggregated into a different zoning system or at a different scale might actually produce different results. As an example of boundary delineation, the first thing that we will have to look at is the study area boundary because the study area that we investigate will influence the statistical analysis. In this very simple uh, example below, drawn from the census, we are asked to describe the Hispanic population of Salt Lake City. Now how should we define the study area? Should it be the city itself, which has a Hispanic population of 22.3%? Should it be the county of Salt Lake, which has a Hispanic population of 17.1%? Or should it be the combined statistical area of the metropolitan region as defined by the census, which has a 14.8% Hispanic rate? If you were doing a report on the Hispanic population in the city, you could really report any of these three numbers and still be correct. So we have to realize that our decision that we make with the study area could drastically change our results. In this example, we can see that the internal and external boundaries that we place over our data set can impact our descriptive statistics of that data set. In this example of quadrat analysis, a point pattern technique that we're going to learn later in the year, we are investigating the presence of, of cholera outbreaks across the city. So each dot here is a case of cholera. And we are tasked with the, f with the job of placing a regular grid over the study area and counting how many cholera outbreaks there are in each grid cell. So here the, we have a 4x4 four four grid, and the variable of interest is how many cholera outbreaks there is in each grid cell. So we can begin by thinking about where we should place the 4x4 four four grid. Let's assume that the size of the aggregation, or the size of the grid cell itself, is already predetermined. We can decide to place the grid such that the grid, the grid cell perfectly matches with the westernmost point. Whoops. So the grid cell matches with the westernmost point and the northwesternmost point. In which case, if we count how many points, how many cholera outbreaks there are in each grid cell, we'll come up with this table, this row of descriptive statistics. There's 16 grid cells, the minimum is 0, the maximum is 2, so the range is 2. The mean is 0.75. We know that because there are 12 cholera outbreaks in 16 grid cells, so the sum is always going to be, the mean will always be 12 over 16. But the standard deviation in this case is 2 thirds, the skewness is close to 0, and the kurtosis is close to negative 1. So slightly more broad than we would expect the distribution to be, slightly more even than we would expect the distribution to be. Instead of matching the points on the north and the west sides, we could have instead matched them on the south and the east sides. And if we place the grid such that we are matching the southern and eastern boundaries, then we have this row in the table. And you can see that here the maximum for any grid cell, instead of being 2, is 3, which might tell us that there's a stronger case that perhaps there's a particular neighborhood in the city that has a, a lot of cholera cases. This 3 is more than all of the other cases that we've seen. The mean is the same, standard deviation, a little bit different, but not so different. But look here with the skewness. We see quite a big increase in the amount of positive skew in the distribution, probably because of the existence of this larger um, positive value, this more extreme positive value. But we also see that the kurtosis has increased, so it's slightly more leptokurtic than it was before. In any event, the point of this isn't to read into the particular 
descriptive statistics that we retrieve in each of these cases, but instead you can see that even by simply moving this grid around, which is, you know, where the original placement of the grid is quite an arbitrary decision that we make, and once in practice we set the grid, we don't keep on moving it around and testing the statistics. Usually in practice we'll just choose arbitrarily where to place the grid, and we'll end up with one of these rows of statistics that we're going to base our analysis on. And you can see that the actual results of our analysis really do depend on where we arbitrarily decided to place the grid in the first place. Another issue with aggregation is the scale problem. So remember the modifiable aerial unit problem is composed of two things, the scale problem and the zoning problem. So the zoning problem has to do with how zones inside a study area are arranged, but the scale problem has to do with the level of aggregation of the zones. And here we are looking at the same data, just displayed at two different levels of aggregation. On the left hand side, we've got the percentage of the population who are Hispanic uh, in a choropleth map. At the, uh, and here we are displaying the data using the county level of aggregation. On the right hand side, we have the percent Hispanic at the state level of aggregation. So as you see, when you have a lower level of aggregation, meaning you've got smaller spatial units, counties in this case, we can observe a finer degree of spatial resolution. Or in other words, we see more spatial variation. So for example, let's look at the state of Texas over here. This map displays Texas all as one color, being in this 25% or more Hispanic category. But over here on this map, we actually see that Texas is quite divided. We've got part of Texas over here, which is only 10 to 25% Hispanic, and then the southwestern part of the state, which is achieving levels much higher than 25%, in fact. So you can see here that when we have smaller zones of aggregation, we're able to see more spatial variation. We're able to see a difference between these two locations on the map, where in this level of aggregation, we don't see any difference between those two parts of Texas.